Good morning and welcome to Online Worship. I'm Leslie Anderson and I'm the Director of Connections here. I'd like to welcome you this morning. We have a message from our Youth Director, Riley, coming up your way. We've got music as always. So we want you to be comfortable right where you are. Let us know where you are today because we know some of you are traveling through Christmas. So get ready, get comfortable because Online Church starts right now.
Good morning. I hope all of you had a, a great Christmas. For those of you who don't know, my name is Riley Metzger. I'm the Director of Student Ministries here at Crossroads, and it is a pleasure to be able to bring God's Word to you this morning. If you would, at this time, please take out your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. That's where we will be camping out. I will be reading out of the New Living Translation, and so uh, if you would, at this time, just go ahead and take that out, um, and we will pray before we get started. Dear Father, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for just this, this season that we're in where we get to celebrate the, the birth of your Savior um, in Jesus, Father. And we just, we thank you for that. I just, I pray, Father, that you just continue to watch over us, you guide us, you just keep us safe uh, during this season. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but I struggle with anxiety. I always have. I think dating back to even when I was a kid, I struggled with anxiety. Something as simple as, as taking a test just always seemed to get me really anxious. And now being a new parent, I struggle with new different forms of anxiety of, you know, I haven't heard my kid breathe in a while when they're sleeping. Like, are they, are they still breathing, right? I think all of us have experienced some form of anxiety at some point in time in our life. But I think for all of us, we tend to react differently to anxiety. For some of us, we're able to have anxious thoughts and be able to just to, to quickly just to, to get those under wraps and just to move on. But for others of us, it's, it's crippling, almost as if we are frozen in indecisiveness. I, I think it's something that has never come easy to me, but I know through the years I've, been learned, I've learned to cope uh, with that whether it's seeing a counselor, it's turning to scripture, or it's in prayer. And a lot of times, it's all three. But the text we're going to look at today in Matthew chapter 2 talks a little bit about a time of anxiousness shortly after Jesus was born. Let's pick up in Matthew chapter 2, uh, 13 through 23. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, Flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to, to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted, outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said. Take the child and, and his mother back to the land of Israel, because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. And this fulfilled what the prophets had said, he will be called a Nazarene. You see, what we see in today's text um, is a, a season of anxiety. And we see where, where God gets Joseph's attention. But before we dig further in, I want to I pause and I want to I I look at a couple of things that Matthew was trying to portray in his uh, gospel. Number one, that Jesus is who the Old Testament prophets say he is, that he is the Messiah. He is the one that Israel has been waiting for. And he does this by quoting some 60 odd times uh, in, in Matthew, in his gospel, about who Jesus is and what the, what the Old Testament says about, says about the coming of the Messiah. And the second thing that he says is that there are two ways to respond to Jesus. The first is to accept and acknowledge him, and the other part is to reject him. And we see that in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew lists all of the descendants dating all the way back to Abraham. And he does that um, in, in a way that is just is beautiful, uh, but it, it goes through all these different generations that lead us from Abraham to Jesus. 
And then if you were here last week, you, you learned in, in Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25, we, we learned about the birth of Jesus, the supernatural pregnancy of Mary, and how Joseph responded in a beautiful way. And then we get to chapter 2 and 1 through 12, which I just so happened to speak on last year. Uh, it talks a little bit about um, how uh, the wise men responded in a way that was acknowledging the Savior, Jesus. And they offered him three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then you see what Herod did. You see how he responded. And he responded in a way that was he felt threatened by Jesus. He felt threatened because he thought that Jesus was coming to take away his throne. When in reality, all Jesus wanted to do was to come into this world to offer everybody eternal life. And then we get to our text in Matthew chapter 2, and we see a couple of things. Number one, we see three dreams that Joseph gets from God. And we see three different responses that he did. Now, a lot of times when God is trying to get our attention, there is usually a response right after. And we see three different times in a dream it says to get up, to flee to a different land. That uh, at times that he was going to have to be obedient. Now, think about this. Joseph in 1 through 12, or in, in, in Matthew chapter 1, was totally given um, a miraculous uh, pregnancy by his then fiance. And he was given a response of saying, Lord, am I going to trust the fact that you have a plan that is better than the plan that I have for me? And then we see again here, too, that he's in a, in a season of anxiety of knowing the fact that, okay, I've got all these different rumors going on about me and my wife and this pregnancy, and now, now, now I've got this guy that's trying to kill my family. And he, he does it in a way that um, is so cruel. It says the fact that in 16 through 17 that, uh, he, that Herod was upset, um, and he, he's sent to have all the little boys in Bethlehem two years and under to be killed. Now think about that. And here you are with a baby that's supposed to be the savior of the world. And now you've got this guy that's got all the power, all the wealth, all the, all the, all the tools and, and resources that he has to be able to kill him. Now, now Joseph is having to try to take care of his family. And what God does is say, no, you know what? You don't need to deal with that. I've got a better plan. I need you to flee to a different land. Now it says he traveled to, uh, to Egypt. Now what's, what's, Notable about this is the fact that Egypt was actually out of uh, King Herod's rule. And so what they were going to have to do was they were going to have to travel. And it says in the first dream that they traveled in the middle of the night. They didn't wait till the next day. They didn't wait till they had all their plans in order. They left that night. The second thing we see is we see three different fulfillments from the Old Testament. We see that in verses 15. We see that again in verses 17 through 18. And we see that again in, verses, uh, in verse 23. Now, the first one uh, in verse 15, it's, it's Matthew quoting Hosea 11.1. 1, and he claims that this passage uh, mentions the exodus out of Israel. Um, and it, that Jesus is the embodiment of Israel. And everything that Israel was meant to be, that is Jesus. That Jesus is the redemptive Messiah. Now, in 17 through 18, he's quoting Jeremiah 31, 15 specifically, um, and it talks about how this is a representation of Bethlehem's mothers, and, and they're weeping uh, for when Pharaoh did the same thing as King Herod. And then we get down to verse 23, and we don't see the fact that it's just one prophet. We see the fact that it's prophets. Now, there's been all these different types of people that try to figure out exactly who Matthew is quoting here, um, but we are not able to, to pinpoint down to one specific prophet or prophets to figure out exactly who all said this. But we do know that Matthew knows the Old Testament. And it's, there's, there's all these different theories on, on who it was and where it was. But the only thing we know is the fact that Matthew knew the Old Testament and that he said the prophets. And so we, we know that through Matthew's extensive knowledge of the Old Testament that this must be true. Next, we see that this was an evil Time. This was an evil time of history. I mean, think about this. Jesus was born, and then shortly after Jesus was born, there seems to be a price on his head that King Herod was out to find him and to, 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 to kill him. But not only that, he goes and does something extreme. He has all the little boys in Bethlehem killed that are two years and under in hopes of fact that he might kill Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but having a child and having anything that might 
come anywhere near the, to, to hurt them. That just brings all these different sorts of emotions and anxiety that I have to deal with in my life. I can't imagine what, what Joseph was like and Mary was like of knowing the fact that somebody so evil and so powerful was out to kill their baby boy. And lastly, we see the fact that they settled in a town called Nazareth. Now, if you're familiar with the Christmas story, you know that Nazareth is the last place that Jesus that we see that Jesus was born and raised. It's, it's, it's a town that we think of significance, but in Jesus' day, this was not a significant place. This was a very small town. Now, we don't know the exact population, but we know that there was somewhere between 100 to 2,000 people that lived in this town. We know that it had a weird reputation of, of two different people groups living together in Samaritans and Gentiles, which was completely just un, unrecognizable in other parts of, of the uh, region that they were in. But we also know that this, this place had a reputation of being uh, sort of like a hick town, right? Um, this was a place that was four miles away from the uh, next biggest city. Um, and so this was a place that was just kind of on the outskirts of town in the country. Um, and it was so, um, it had such a bad reputation. We see in, in John's gospel, uh, in, in, in John 1, 45 through 46, in, in a conversation between Philip and Nathaniel, um, it, it says this, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. And Philip said, come and see. You know, Israel seemed to be that town that seemed to be the butt of every single joke, that nothing could good can come out of that, that it was despised, and it was a place that people couldn't fathom that the Messiah would come from. And they just had a hard time believing that the Messiah was going to be born, or he was going to be raised in Nazareth. But God had a different plan, that this was the place that was going to mold and shape Jesus in, in his adult years, uh, into his, in his teenhood, where he would, he would study the rest of the Old Testament with the rest of the boys that were there as custom to uh, the Old Testament. But what can we learn from this text? Well, number one, that we need to be receptive to God's guidance. Joseph was receptive to God's guidance in chapter two, or in chapter one, and it's a continuation here in chapter two. Think about it. Think about all the things that he had to go through from the miraculous birth of, of Mary and, um, or the miraculous birth of Jesus uh, and the virgin birth of, of Mary and all the different rumors that were going to have to go on with that. But not only that, he, he had to deal with the fact that somebody was trying to kill his baby boy. The anxiety uh, it would have been terrifying for him where he may have felt just crippled in time and frozen in time and not knowing what to do. But then God got his attention in a dream, and all he had to do was to obey him. You see, a lot of times God's plans don't make sense to the rest of the world. But we do know this from Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. God got Joseph's attention through dreams. But how, God, how might God be getting your attention? You know, I know for me, a lot of times the way that God gets my attention is through repetitive phrases or repetitive uh, Bible messages. Um, and so a lot of times I might, I might hear a sermon, and a couple of days later I, I see it in, in, my, in my daily devotions, or I, I hear it in a podcast, and I know that when I hear things two or three times that God is trying to get my attention. But I can only do that um, when, when I know that... Um, uh, I've got something going on, and God uses something repetitive to get my attention. Something that we tell all of our students all the time is that we want to give God at least 1% of our day. 1% of our day is of 24 hours is a little under 15 minutes, about 14 minutes and 46 seconds that we get a chance to, uh, to, to be in God's word and, and in prayer. Now, it's not the fact that God is limited to 15 minutes, but it's just a, a great place to start where we can learn and be receptive to God's guidance. Number two, that following Jesus isn't easy. Think about it. Joseph and Mary had to flee in the middle of the night to, to thwart off King Herod's plans. And in, it, was, it was a great distance. We know that through commentaries that they traveled hundreds of miles, giving up their physical comfort, their financial comfort, and everything that they've ever known to keep their family safe. You see, just like, just like Jesus, Joseph was a carpenter. 
And so when they moved from town to town, he was going to have to find a, a new place to work. And, and we know that uh, today that when people move, even in, from one house to another in the same town, that it's, it's just hard to be able to do that, let alone moving from town to town in a place that you're not familiar with. I don't know about you, but that just sounds hard. But it's a sacrifice that they had to make in order to obey the Lord. Today, it's no different being a follower of Jesus. And in today's society, it is no longer cool to acknowledge the fact that you are a Christian, that you follow Jesus because the world has its own way of dealing with things and Jesus has his own way of dealing with things. And those two worlds just collide. And what happens is we've got all these different things that are are vying for our time, whether it's going to the sporting activity or it's going to this band concert or, or whatever it is. And so a lot of times... We have to, in order just to get to church on Sunday morning or to be able to watch this uh, message on, online, we've got to be able to, to give up some sort of comfort in our life to be able to experience Jesus in a way that we can only do uh, with other people. But maybe God's calling us to do different things in this time of, of season of anxiety, whether it's uh, devoting our life to um, different things, to, to give up our physical comfort, uh, to be able to come to church on a Sunday morning, or it's, it's God saying, you know what, you will have abundantly too much money, or you, don't, you, you might not have a ton, but you have enough. And so God might be calling us to, to give financially in different ways, whether it's to the new lighting project in the sanctuary or it's to another local mission uh, ministry in, in our central Illinois area. We've got all these different ministries that are around here. What, is, what are you willing to sacrifice in order to follow Jesus? And last but not least, to, to rest in the Prince of Peace. You see, when I look back at this text and I look in Matthew chapter 1 and and 2 and in Matthew uh, chapter 2, I see the fact that Joseph was anxious, but he wasn't troubled. He wasn't anxious uh, or he wasn't troubled because he had something in his possession. The prince of peace was with him. Jesus, his own son, that the fact that he, he could rest in, in God's promise that, J, that God had a different plan for Joseph than what he could ever could have imagined in his life, that, that he sent Jesus, that God sent Jesus in, into this world to deal with the problem of sin and to restore our relationship back to God. You see, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but he have eternal life. That's exactly what Jesus came here to do, was to offer everybody eternal life. When we put our hope and trust and faith in Jesus, it means that we are are giving up things, that we are giving up our own ambitions, our own hopes, and our own dreams, and maybe even ultimately our life. Now, on paper, that seems easy, but in reality, it's it's hard. Um, But we are people, and getting rid of things is hard because we have this emotional attachment to them. But when we put our hope and trust and faith in Jesus, we we are gaining eternal life in heaven that we cannot gain here on earth. There's nothing that we can do to earn our way into heaven. It's only through putting our hope and trust and faith in Jesus that that is possible. You see, Jesus said in John 16, 33, that I have said these things to you, that in, in me, you may have peace. Jesus didn't say that there would be peace on earth. He said that he would be peace. And when we put our hope and trust and faith in Jesus, we are able to experience that peace. Here's what it says um, in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So how are you going to respond? Are you going to accept him and acknowledge him, or are you going to do what King Herod did and what, what the world says, and I'm going, and you're going to reject him? God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son into this world to give you eternal life. To, to, he, he died for our sins, so we don't have to pay the punishment for that. That no how many times that we have failed because of our own wrongdoings, that God still desires to save you and have a relationship with you. God is offering you a fresh start right now through life with Jesus. And if you are willing to receive this grace, you will be, you will be able to experience, as Jason says, abundantly far more than we could by ourselves.
All we have to do is admit the fact that we are a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins on the cross and from the grave. He ascended into heaven and will turn one day to for, for every single one of us because he is our Savior. And confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord of our life and we will be saved. We all have access to Jesus, the Prince of Peace, in a season of anxiety. It's whether the fact that we are going to accept him or reject him that will determine the course of our life. Thanks, and have a great day.